Hello everyone, this is Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this video is Experiment Designs in Computer Science Topic 7 Factorial Design. First, uh, let's talk about the feedback from the last lecture. So, um, hello everyone and sorry for last week, there was uh, some problems uh, with conference and stuff like that, so I summarized the planning material from last week and this week on this video and this material. Next week, we will have a review for the final examination. So we have two more classes in this lecture. Uh, this week now we will have the review and next week it will be the final examination. And also after that, uh, don't forget uh, your report number two. So this week, final review for this for the for for the course next week final examination and then after that we have the deadline for report two okay well this week i asked everyone uh last week i asked everyone where would they go if they could travel in time and space think doctor who and i found it interesting that there was a wide variety of answers uh just grappling just um clustering some of them we had a lot of people mentioning places in asia so two people for kyushu wanted to go to kyushu Kyoto, one people wanted to go to Kyushu, someone said Universal Studios, uh, some people said Okinawa, one person said Japan, I imagine that someone has not arrived in Japan yet, uh, one person said China, some person said South Korea. Then we had eight people suggesting places in Europe, so Germany, Poland, two people Iceland, two people France, six people suggested places in the US, so two in Hawaii, two US in general, two people suggested Las Vegas, which I found kind of interesting. Five people suggested the space, which I found kind of cool. Three people said that they wanted to visit the space station, and two people said that they wanted to visit the moon. So that's really nice. A few other places, one person said Australia, one person said a small island far away from the internet, and I really understand this. Uh, and one person said the, Egypt, uh, the pyramids in Egypt. Finally, 10 people mentioned time travel. So one wanted to see the Big Bang, which I find it to be pretty cool. One wanted to go to 947 in Roswell. This is the, um, I believe it's like the X area or something like that, which they said that a UFO crashed. One person said Tokyo in World War II. One person said New York and the Twin Tower attack. Uh, one person said they wanted to give advice to themselves in the past. Um, one person also said they wanted to go back to high school. And finally, four people said that they wanted to go to the far away future to see Earth in the future. The dates, though, were quite different. So one person said 2,200, one person said 2,500, one person said 3,022, one a thousand years in the future. So a lot of very different ideas. OK, now let's go to the technical questions. And the first question that I asked is when you should not use study repetitions. Most of you got this answer correct. Um, so I asked for two reasons, but there are several. Uh, in order of importance, the reasons that I can think of is that, well, you don't use 30 repetitions because you calculate the sample size. So you calculate the sample size and the result was a number that was different from 30. Another is when the cost of experiment is too high, it may be impossible to have 30 or more observations. So this is something that we said, right? Sometimes you have to do a simulation that is very expensive, or you have to invite people, or some, or you have to do some medical experiment, and the cost is too high to have a high number of observations. So sometimes you have to have lower power on your tests. Sometimes you have maybe another reason would be that the experiment requires special conditions. So if you have an experiment that can only be done during an eclipse then the number of times that you can do this experiment is limited. So you have a limited number of replicates. Finally, when we're using a statistical analysis that does not require the assumption of normality, even then you still need to calculate the number of necessary observations. But usually the idea of 30 repetitions is that you want to make sure that um, you got like your sample distribution follows a normal curve. If you're using some statistics that do not require assumption of normality, uh, this is not such a big concern. Now, there were some answers that were quite incorrect that I wanted to mention. So for instance, one person said, when we don't need high accuracy, and the number of observations is not related to the experiment accuracy, but with the power and confidence. Please be careful with this term. What does accuracy mean? 
What does power mean? What does confidence mean? If you repeat an experiment many, many times, it will not get more accurate. The accuracy of the experiment is always the same. What changes is that you have a better estimate of how much accurate the experiment is, but the accuracy does not change. Okay. Now, uh, one of the situations is that the sample follow a normal distribution. In this situation, the CLT doesn't make sense. Uh, the CLT still applies for a variable following the normal distribution. I don't really quite get what you're trying to say here. I don't think there is a smaller. There can be a smaller sample size than thirty samples. Yes, yes, you can have smaller observations, smaller sample sizes than thirty observations. It's not necessary. The minimum size is not thirty observations by any means. Uh, I mean, even if you look at the examples that we use, there was one example that we have seven observations, and we have a quite reasonable power, especially when you use things like some pairing and blocking that we're going to talk about today, you can have a higher power with, even with a small number of observations. When the case is random, I, I'm not sure what this means. So be careful what you're writing. Uh, make sure that you're trying to, you know the, 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 the keywords for the concepts that you want to talk about. Make sure that you do a good review of the topics that we have discussed through the course. Many people have gave specific examples of experiments, for example, when estimating the proportion of left-handed people in a school was one of the examples that I see. This is not a good answer because you don't explain why. So for instance, when estimating the proportion of left-handed people in the school because one observation is a classroom and the school has less than 30 classrooms. So if you don't, if you're not a specific why, I really cannot understand what is specific for this experiment that allows you to use a different number of observations. Remember that for the same experiment, you can have different statistical analysis. So you need to be a little bit more precise than just giving like an example of an experiment. Okay, the second question was to calculate the sample size of the example that I gave last class. This question was a little bit of a trick one because to obtain this answer, you need to choose some variables that were not specified in the example. Namely, you need to choose the delta, the difference of interest, and which of the experiments was to be analyzed. For the main objective of this question was to try and apply the calculations. So whichever choice you made here, it was okay. As long as you follow the procedure that I'm going to describe below, you would reach a sensible answer for the calculation of the sample size. If you had difficulty of this question, many people said, oh, I don't know, I don't know. It's fine, but remember that you need to learn this for this course. So make sure that you try to apply this, um, try to answer this question this week so that you know how to calculate a sample size. If you don't know how to calculate a sample size, how are you going to do your own experiments, right? So anyway, the calculation of the sample size procedure First, you choose alpha, beta, and D, okay? You can choose D based on a specific request of the experiments or by using the standard deviation multiplied by some small number. Then you obtain the standard deviation either from problem knowledge or if you don't have the standard deviation, if you don't know what the standard deviation is, you can use the sample error as an estimate. Finally, using this information, choosing alpha, beta, d, and calculating the standard deviation, you can calculate the sample size n for one sample using the power t-test. Of course, this sample size is when you want to use the t-test anyway. If you want to use a different test, then you use the power calculation for that different test. So if you use an ANOVA, you use the power of ANOVA. If you use a non-parametric test, you calculate the power of that non-parametric test. Some of the, the values that the students calculate, not of all of these are correct, but if you follow this procedure, then your value is probably reasonable. So we had like seven observations, 20 observations, three people calculated between 26 and 27 observations, which I imagine is a reasonable value. And about other three people calculated 40 or 41. So I, I guess it depends on what experiment you're choosing to calculate the sample size. Uh, two people calculated 128, which I think it's a little bit inflated. You can probably get with about 26 or 40 observations. Two people suggested 1,000 observations. I have no idea where they got this number. So I'm kind of curious. Now, let's go to the general comments from all the students. 
So one student asks, if normality or multisticity are violated, may I use the Kurskawalis test instead of the ANOVA? Yes. In general, you can always use a non-parametric test in place of a parametric test. Just note that the power of a non-parametric test is weaker than the power of a parametric test. So be careful about that. Explanation of terms is common in assignments at the university. When we make the answer, which should be priorized? Make an answer without looking at the material to demonstrate your known understanding or make an answer by quoting from the material. It really depends on the type of assignment. Some assignments are open book, which means that you are allowed to refer to materials, while other assignments are closed book, which means that you are not allowed to refer to the materials. Make sure to check which kind of assignment it is. Even if the assignment is open book, if you use a reference, you should cite the reference that you use. Okay? I'm not sure I used the correct sample size here because of the aggregation. This is a very good question. In this case, the aggregation would affect the estimation of the standard deviation. But usually, this effect is not important since you are interested in the aggregated result. So you are calculating a sample size for the aggregated. So it would be an aggregated sample size. So that's okay. About question three, I understand that I can use power to test to calculate the power, but I don't understand how to set each parameter. So, uh, if the standard deviation is not available from polynomial knowledge, you can estimate it from the sample error. So, we talked about this in class. For delta, it needs to be estimated from problem knowledge. In the case of question 3, where you don't have problem knowledge, using a small multiple of the standard deviation is also appropriate. Like, I want the delta to be at least two standard deviations, or one standard deviation. Do we have to calculate in the exam? You do not have to do any complicated calculations. Some simple calculations, such as like the total number of factors or the total number of levels or the total number of combinations in a factorial design, might be necessary, but no complicated calculations. It was mentioned in lecture 4 that power, the probability of a type 2 error, I understand that power means here. In the lecture 5, another power distribution was mentioned. Is it the same? Is it different? This is a very good question. The power of an experiment and power distribution are two completely different things. Power of an experiment means the probability of type 2 error, as we explained, or how sensitive is the experiment to small differences between the new hypothesis and the real value. An experiment with low power can only detect very big differences, while an experiment with high power can detect even small differences. On the other hand, Power distribution is a statistical distribution which follows a power law. For example, y equal kx to the power of a. This is a power. This the uh, the distribution that follows this equation would be a power distribution. Be careful to not confuse these two concepts. For our course, the power of the experiment is the more important concept to remember. In my understanding, when we do a bootstrap, we must treat it as if the new sample is a sample distributing instead of the population distribution. Yes, this is correct. Then if we want to do the t-test ANOVA on the bootstrap sample, we must use a different formula. Not necessarily. The formulas are similar because the sampling distribution tends to follow a normal distribution. The main difference is that the standard error will be much smaller. So we're talking about the power considering the... Um, the, 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 the bootstrap distribution, the bootstrap sample. I want to practice all the scenarios explained in class through the standard concept. I will try to do this in R. Yes, please use the data files provided to repeat the R code shown in class. I still cannot understand the minimally relevant effect size very well. How to determine this amount? The minimally relevant effect size is the size of the difference between two values that is important to you. To give you an example, if you repeat a simulation experiment one million times, it's possible to find a difference of one nanosecond in that, in theory, according to the formula, is statistically significant. However, this difference has no practical meaning. Okay, So it's necessary to choose a minimal difference that is important for the research that you are doing. If the research that you are doing care about one second difference, then that's your uh, that's your relevant effect size. If the research you're doing care about one millisecond difference, then that's your minimally relevant effect size. So not everything can be solved by formulas. Sometimes you have to really understand what kind of research you are doing. All right, so these were the comments for last week. 
Thank you very much all for your comments. And next, we will see a video up with the topic for this week. Bye bye.